Day 94 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Today, we are meeting the 12th judge, probably the giant of all judges, Samson. We will see his story span across four chapters, the first three of those happening today, reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. But one quick housekeeping thing. I know that yesterday the graphic for the heart checks was incorrect. So what I did is I added that screen to yesterday's notes. I know that some of you all like to screenshot those. So I did put that in there for the correction. I'm not going to make the correction on the video just because that would require me editing it and re-uploading a video, which makes no sense. So I just want to let you guys know that if you wanted to grab those heart checks. Otherwise, if you could please help us out if you're part of the Heart Dive fam by hitting that like button, that little thumbs up. Also making sure you're subscribed to the channel, got that notification bell on and hopefully joining us in our Facebook group to continue discussion. And if you are new here, we've got lots of information in the description box or the show notes, or you can check out our website, heartdive.org. And just a reminder, again, we have all of the heart checks, the chapter summaries, the prayer, and the deep dive questions available for you in PDF format in our shop on our website. You can either purchase those for $1 a day if you just think, man, this was a wonderful day. I want to be able to have that. Or if you want to purchase the monthly bundle, that's available for $21 a month. And this actually supports the work that Holly and I do. This is our tent making business to be able to allow us to continue to do this work of the ministry. So thank you for those of you who continue to support in that. We are extremely grateful that we are able to pour into this, pour into you, but also continue to pour into our families as well. So grateful for that. Otherwise, let's go ahead and pray and jump into today's reading. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that your will is ultimately the best for our lives. It was already planned out from before we were even born. And so we're going to place our trust in you and in that plan and purpose for our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to value our story. So I pray that we will come into alignment with that because we no longer want to be off of the beaten path, Lord. We want to be in step with you, walking toward you, toward our promised land. Forgive us of our sins, help us to forgive others, and lead us not into temptation. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So starting off here in chapter 13, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So 13th verse, same as the first, or 13th chapter, same as the first. Here we go again with the chapter beginning with the cycle of sin, except I don't know if you noticed this time, there's no repentance involved, no crying out to the Lord, which shows how hardened the hearts of Israel have become. And thankfully, it isn't all people, because we will see in this chapter how responsive one couple is. But regardless, we see what is happening to the nation as a whole. And this reminds us that our relationship with the Lord is not static. You know, we might have our security in heaven, in our salvation, but the ability to experience the fullness of His glory, both here on earth and in heaven, hinges on our relationship with Him. So, the more we read the Word, one of two things is going to happen. Either we are going to become more open and more responsive to the things that we hear and read about, or we're going to allow our own selfish thinking to create even more doubt, and then we're going to begin that downward spiral of closing ourselves off, aka hardening our hearts. So heart check. What is your relationship status? Is your heart changing as you read God's word? Are you getting closer to the Lord or pulling away? And just a reminder here, the Philistines have taken over a lot of control in this region. They are from Crete. They are a coastal people who actually settled in the southern region of Israel. They were iron smelters, which means they had some really advanced weaponry. And they ended up building in this area five main cities, and they will rule in this region for hundreds of years. Verse two, there was a certain man of Zorah. Zorah is in the foothills of Jerusalem of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And I love whenever I read about instances like this, because I know there are so many people who are holding out hope or who are praying for a child. And I'm like, if anybody can do it, God 
can do it. I don't care what doctors tell you. They tell you you're barren. They tell you you're infertile. I still believe in the miracle of God. I have seen it happen where he has given a child to someone that was promised that they could no longer have children. No razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So this is good news to the parents who are under Philistine oppression to hear that they are going to be released from that oppression or at least begin to. So notice that the failure of Samson is already known. He's not going to be able to deliver them completely, but he can begin the process. And so what this angel is telling the mother is your child is going to be a lifelong Nazarite. You remember the Nazarite vow? Now, this is very different because this is a lifelong vow. Typically, these vows had a period of time attached to them, and they were not allowed to drink alcohol. They could not shave their head, and they could not touch dead bodies. And this was a really serious vow to be taken, to be set apart for the Lord during that time. And while Samson will begin this process of that deliverance, it will be completed by David ultimately. Verse six, then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from and he did not tell me his name. So this is where we say it must be a theophany or possibly a theophany. There is a little bit of debate between that, but it seems here that this is no ordinary angel of the Lord, but God himself through Jesus, of course. But he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. And I was like, this is really interesting that the angel keeps appearing to the wife and not the man. And I asked, why is that? Now, I don't know the answer. My thinking is that perhaps it's because she is open and available for him to speak to her while Manoah is out working in the fields. She's in that quiet place. And that's pretty typical for women. You know, we just have this earnest desire to be at the feet of Jesus. I mean, look at Mary. That doesn't make women any better, but that's just part of our nature. But this being a lesson to both men and women that we must be in the quiet place to allow the Lord to speak to our hearts because he speaks in a whisper. So if we're in the midst of all of this chaos and noise of the world, how are we ever going to hear him? So Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Now, this is awesome because this goes to show what kind of respect they have in their marriage. They have that mutual respect for each other. You know, the man wasn't just brushing off his wife like, Woman, I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. No, he listens to her. And the moment that she tells him something, he arises and he goes. And I believe this is wisdom on both sides of marriage to listen to one another, to respect the things that your spouse is saying, because they wouldn't say it if they didn't feel that it was important, right? Verse 12, and Manoah said, now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life and what is his mission? Now, when he says manner of life, this is most likely speaking of what is his education going to be? What kind of job is he going to hold? He wanted details at this point. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. So he's not answering him about the child. He's answering about what he's already spoken to his wife. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So clearly here, the angel is basically saying, I'm not going to tell you all the details of the future because I'm asking you for present day obedience. And I don't think this is a bad thing that he wants details of the future. I mean, we're all kind of like that, right? And I can only imagine that being in the presence of the angel of the Lord, you're going to want to make sure that you get the correct information. So this could have actually been excitement on his part as well, rather than doubt. But the angel cracks me up the way he simply repeats the instructions that he has already given them. So he is emphasizing that obedience does not rest upon future knowledge or more knowledge, because that wouldn't be faith. Remember, Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Faith is being able to act upon the revelation despite knowing the outcome or having all of the details. So heart check. Do you need all the details before moving forward in faith? 
Verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. So this would have been an act of thanksgiving and gratitude. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat of your food. Now this made me think, "Uh uh-oh, maybe this isn't God because he is not allowing them to do any sort of act of worship toward him. However, going along the lines that this is actually God himself, this is him saying, I don't need your food. So he continues, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. Now remember the name of God is the character of God. And the fact that he is saying his name is wonderful. Well, we also see in Isaiah when it speaks of Jesus prophetically, that his name is wonderful and counselor and everlasting father. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord to the one who works wonders. So they are going to now see a wondrous work take place. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching and they fell on their faces to the ground. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God. Because remember, the Lord says that anybody who sees him will die. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. Now, this is not her criticizing or rebuking her husband. She's offering him some loving encouragement. Like, don't worry, honey, this is a good thing. Verse 24, and the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Maenadan between Zorah and Eshdale. Now the word stir has both positive and negative implications. You know, we can stir up trouble by disturbing the current state of something or the way that it's used here, the spirit will begin to stir something within us to move us into motion. I mean, I remember as a little girl, I used to love to stir glasses of water and just watch that tornado effect. It was mesmerizing to me, but the water was being put into motion. So whenever the spirit begins to stir within us, us, it is for the purpose of moving us into action. And even in scripture, you know, the Lord stirred the hearts of the people to bring offerings, to begin creating things, and ultimately to do his work. And stirring can even start at an early age. You know, from my earliest memory, I always wanted to be a teacher. I mean, I had chalkboards. I had those spiral bound teacher notebooks that my parents ordered for me from the teacher store. And I would play school with my stuffed animals well into middle school. And I'm sure you can imagine that I was so disheartened in college whenever I actually began teaching part time. And I realized I was not cut out to teach, at least not in that capacity. But now I see how that stirring was not in vain as I am now fully in motion in teaching God's word. So heart check. What is the Lord stirring within you? Chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, Timnah is on the northwest border of Judah in Dan's territory, and this is under Philistine rule. So he's basically going into Philistine territory here, and he sees one of the Philistine daughters. This is already beginning the cycle of sin. He goes down into the place where he shouldn't be going, meddling in things he shouldn't be meddling in, and he is allowing himself to look. Because remember that cycle of sin? They see, they envy, then they start to move that into motion. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now, this clearly is the biggest problem of Samson's life, that he just wants whatever he wants. He's being a big bully, dishonoring his parents at this point and their will and God's will because they weren't even supposed to marry foreigners. So this is very self-centered and it actually foreshadows the state of the entire nation of Israel that they will do whatever is right in their own eyes. 
Verse 4, his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So God is going to allow this to accomplish his purpose. This is what he will often do. So he didn't make it happen, but he allowed it to happen. And even though God is going to bring good from this disobedience, it doesn't justify his actions here. And sadly, Samson is going to experience a lot more pain than he probably would have just obeyed his parents. Then and Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, remember, he's not even supposed to eat anything that is related to the grapes. So now he is playing with fire, going to places he shouldn't be once again. And behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. So the lion is always lurking. The lion, the one who devours, is always lurking in places we shouldn't be. This is why we shouldn't go there. I mean, this is like being told you cannot drink alcohol and then you show up at the bar. Verse six, then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. So with his bare hands, he tore it up, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman and she was right in Samson's eyes. So there we go again. He went down. So he is walking into sin step by step, going back to his selfishness. So the spirit of the Lord coming upon a person doesn't necessarily make them more godly. It gives them the ability to be more godly and to be empowered in whatever they need, but it still takes a choice on our part when we are empowered to do the right thing. Verse 8, after some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out into his hands, which he's not supposed to do as a Nazarite, not supposed to touch the carcass of a body, and went on eating as he went. So very selfish once again, right? And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them. Now, that's kind of sweet. And they ate, but he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. So he He's kind of all show, no go. He is trying to do a good thing here, but not tell him where he got it from. Kind of like that Robin Hood mentality almost. But nevertheless, he violated his Nazarite vow. And his father went down to the woman and Samson prepared a feast there. Now, this is kind of like a bachelor party. And this word feast here actually refers to the fact that there will be alcohol there. For so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. So this would kind of be like his groomsmen. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you guys 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. Now, these aren't just ordinary clothes. He's not offering them Fruit of the Loom t-shirts and BVDs. Now, he's going to bring them some Armani. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater comes something to eat. Out of the strong comes something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. Now, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You don't love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. Now here we're starting to see the problem of marrying the foreigner. And this kind of goes along with what the Lord tells us in not marrying someone who is unequally yoked, because you're always going to have disagreements. You're going to be on two different sides of the fence. You're never going to be able to see eye to eye, especially when it comes to making big decisions. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? And she wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. Now, can you imagine a wife weeping before a husband for seven days? And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard and basically he's pretty annoyed. Then she told the riddle to her people and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Now, this was not a very nice term that he is using here for his wife. And here we see how Samson resented his wife for what has just happened. You know, this is the negative effect of giving in to something just to keep the peace. So peacekeeping is not always the best method. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to pursue peace, which means peace doesn't come through passivity or by dancing around the way that Samson did. Because when we do that, 
We are just denying that inevitable conflict that he is seeing here. So giving in to manipulation might work in the short term and bring a little bit of respite from that pressing, but ultimately it comes with a cost. You see, if Samson had the power to rip apart a lion with his bare hands, he could have dealt with his wife, but his selfish gains meant more to him and therefore it cost him in the end. So heart check. Do you give in when the pressing gets hard just to keep the peace? Or are you confronting conflict by the guidance of the Holy Spirit? And sadly, she got what she wanted, but ultimately lost her husband. Now, when I think about it, I'm like, I don't know that they actually loved each other all that much at this point. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. So this is how he got the new garments for those 30 men. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. So he may have won the battle, but he lost the war. So in the end, we see that God alone decides who, what, and how he's going to get the job done. In fact, it's a recurring theme throughout the Old Testament for God to use ungodly people and situations for good. And we will also see throughout the Bible where people begin dictating their ideals onto God. I mean, the Pharisees did that with Jesus, right? Whenever he wasn't doing everything to their religious standard. But what we have to remember is that we are made in God's image and not the other way around. He doesn't belong to our theology or denominations. He rules over it. So it's really not up to us to declare ministries as ungodly based on our standards. I mean, I've got people every day calling this channel and this ministry unbiblical just because I'm a woman. Yet God is doing incredible things here. And if I am wrong in the end, God will deal with me. And I know that, but he's going to get the glory. So that is really all that matters to me. I mean, sidebar, I don't believe that what we're doing here is unbiblical. I know this based on the fruit that is coming from it. But my point is, if we think this way, then we are creating a religious ideal that you somehow got to be good enough for God to use you. And that doctrine of grace goes right out the window when we start thinking like that. And so does this entire book of Judges. Now, on the flip side, this doesn't mean that we skirt sound doctrine or theological accuracy. God never did excuse Samson's behavior, but the implication is that we cannot completely dismiss what God is doing through people based on our boundaries, because he can and he will use our mistakes for good. So heart check, do you believe that God can use anyone for his purpose? Where do you fit into that idea? Chapter 15. After some days at the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in, and her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So obviously very angry at this point. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches. Now, most commentators believe that at this point, these are jackals, which are very similar to foxes, but they travel in packs. So it would have been easier to catch 300 jackals instead of 300 foxes. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And I was thinking, this sounds like such a juvenile method, but okay. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain, as well as the olive orchards. Then the Philistines said, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So now holding her accountable, ultimately what she was trying to get away from when those 30 men came to her saying, you need to get this riddle for us, that fate is still upon her, which really could have been much different if she had just been honest with Samson and said, hey, this is what is going on. But they clearly didn't have that kind of relationship. 
And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you. And after that, I will quit. Now, this is wrong here that he is trying to take vengeance or revenge upon the people because God said that vengeance is his. So this is not his place to do that, but he's gonna. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Etam. Now, this term here, struck them hip and thigh, is very obscure. So there are several theories as to what this means. Some say this meant top to bottom, so he completely destroyed them. Others think this means it has something to do with wrestling or that he dismembered them. So... I don't know which one you're going with. Verse nine, then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson to do him as he did to us. Then 3000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? So the really sad thing that we see here is that they're coming up against Against one of their own because they fear the Philistines. And he said to them, as they did to me, so have I done to them. And they said to him, we have come down to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, no, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Now using new ropes meant the strongest ropes that they are putting around him. Now, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jaw bone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it. And with it, he struck 1000 men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. Now, again, the irony here is that the Philistines had the most advanced weaponry, yet they are being defeated by a donkey jaw. But that's the way that God works. He likes to use the foolish things to confound the wise. So we can't put anything past him. Verse 17, as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand. And that place was called Ramath Lehi, which means hill of the jawbone. And he was very thirsty and he called upon the Lord and said, you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant and shall now I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. So this is good that he's calling out to the Lord. At least we see that he has relationship with him. And God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned and he revived. Therefore, the name of that place was called en Hakore, and it is at Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines, 20 years. So 20 years of both peace and prosperity. So we see that he actually did well. And in the end, this chapter is a classic case of conflict fueled by anger and pride and jealousy and how destructive it can really be. And taking a look at some of our deep dive questions, how significant is the Nazarite vow in the life of Samson? How might we apply these principles to our lives? What characteristics of Manoah and his wife can you see? Does God honor them? How is Samson's marriage relevant to our faith today? What role does the Spirit of the Lord play in Samson's life? And what about yours? Was Samson's anger and vengeance justified? What consequences did he face? And how does God's involvement in today's reading strengthen your faith? So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for never leaving us to fight as a lone warrior in this life. You know, while we know Samson was never alone and that it was only by your Spirit that he was victorious, it doesn't take the fear away. But what your spirit does is teaches us how to fight through that fear. And despite Samson's rage and bitterness, revenge and pride, you still used him for your greater purpose, shooting holes through anyone's idea that God can only use the holiest of holies. We know that simply isn't true. It doesn't give us a permission slip to live and act however we want, but it does give us hope whenever we hold ourselves back from entering the ring. So empower us today, Holy Spirit, so that we will be strengthened in the gifts and the calling that you have ordered. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us whenever we do cry out and for reviving us when we are spiritually parched. I pray that we will not hold back from seeking you and that we won't delay any longer in allowing you to do what you desire in and through us. And sometimes if we have to thirst, 
We know that sometimes you need to allow a trial so that we do not become prideful. So forgive us if we have been doing whatever seems right in our own eyes or caving under the pressure of temptation. All of that serves self and not you. And that's not how we want to live. We know that a life lived in service to you is far more abundant than the one that gives us what we want in the moment. And sometimes it is hard for us to see beyond our own desires, but I pray that you will allow our vision to surpass our fancies so that we can see beyond ourselves. May we never manipulate anyone into giving us what we want. And God forbid we try to manipulate you to fit into our ideal manifest. Forgive us, Lord, if we have been skirting conflict in the name of keeping peace. We know that the best way to cure conflict is with truth and mercy. So I pray that we will avoid future resentment by dealing with it right now. May we be peacemakers instead. We are so grateful for you, the Lion of Judah, that roars inside of us, allowing us to defeat the enemy that comes to devour. But this doesn't give us an excuse to hang out in places where we shouldn't be or to play with fire for your spirit upon us doesn't make us any godlier. Our obedience is required, but how powerful a force we will be whenever we do marry your spirit with our obedience. So help us to keep that in mind always. Your purpose will always prevail, but how wonderful it would be to carry it out with efficiency rather than resistance. And I thank you for allowing us to see you today, God, and for strengthening our faith. You live up to every single name, and today we declare you as wonderful. We love you so much in Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven, of all my sins. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.